panel started, which is on memory of communism after 1989. Uh, and the first two speakers will present together. Uh, uh, Esther Barta, Borta first, and Andras Dott. Uh, Esther is, uh, works at the Institute of Sociology at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and uh, also at the Department of East European Studies at Eltvas Lorenz University in Budapest. And she is focused in her research on labor history in Eastern Europe and the transition from uh, socialism to capitalism, as is the title, the subtitle of uh, your book, it's, uh, and also the main title, which is Alienating Labor. Um, and Andras Tot is uh, at the Institute of Political Sciences at the uh, Hungarian Academy of Sciences, um, studies labor and industrial relations, sociology of labor markets, democratic transitions, um, and uh, with a focus, I think, on Hungary. So we'll now listen to their presentation. Which also showed 
that the so-called core workers were in the better conditions than the other workers. They were privileged by the management, and uh, they uh, could uh, successfully bargain with the management because of the, uh, of the fulfillment of the plan. Uh, so in fact, this thesis that uh, the working class was a united revolutionary force was in Hungary already uh, repudiated or disproved even before 1989. This is more or less a historical background. So what you should remember is that the working class is segmented, or was segmented, historically so, and uh, uh, the Communist Party tried to, to, try to uh, impose this uh, class consciousness from above on the workers, uh, which they reluctantly accepted. So, I mean, the third question was how did the large industrial working class, so these core workers, experience the post socialist change? The place of research for two ex socialist model factory, and let me stress the point that both factories are located in the most developed parts of both East Germany and Hungary. So they are not very industrialized, but uh, industrialization is going on, development is going on. Uh, so, in this sense, uh, the regions themselves don't belong to the losers of the change of regimes. And I already mentioned that so 40-40 life history interviews were conducted with workers between who at the time, so between 2002 and 2004, were between 45 and 65 years old. Well, one or two were, were older, but the majority belonged to this cohort. And they were both male and female. So just uh, I think we rather reach the conclusions because <laughs> these are the most important things and on which can continue with the new research. The dimension of work. So there was a clear experience of uh, 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 peripheralization in Hungary. Uh, workers would complain that uh, the factory was, uh, was, was privatized but it didn't get enough capital and uh, there was no uh, developments within the factory uh, or enterprise, and uh, the new owners just wanted to sell the import the uh, value of the estates of the factory. Uh, so this was more or less the Hungarian uh, experience to, in the Ivan sentence, but I can continue on that. But uh, uh, the Israel experience was completely different. Uh, the card size was the factory. It was taken over by the Israel German size, uh, and of, well, there was huge layoffs. Uh, so only about uh, uh, less than one uh, fifth of the people remained. Uh, but those who remained experienced the uh, development, improvement of, of course, the wages, because very good wages, uh, or relatively good wages, uh, canteen was, was improved, uh, bathroom facilities were improved. Uh, so they experienced uh, in the dimension of work development. But in the German case, the unemployment was a huge, a much more, much bigger problem than in Hungary. In fact, they speak of the two third society, the Zweitelgesellschaft, that one third of the people are out of job, and the two thirds who have the job have a relatively good life. <coughs> so unemployment was a very uh, bad, or the most negative experience the East Germans would uh, tell us about, would tell me about. Um, and not necessarily in terms of uh, standard of living, also they of course mentioned that it means basically exclusion from the wealthier strata of society, but also in terms of psychologically. So many uh, people uh, spoke, uh, mentioned the husbands or spouses who got depressed, committed suicide, uh, became alcoholics as a result of unemployment. So to put the one sentence, the German experience was not necessarily the, the poverty itself, but the psychological consequences of long-term unemployment. Next dimension. The dimension of the material world. Hungarian workers would all speak of the declining standard of living. Even those who had uh, adult children, so they didn't have to, have to support the, their children, spoke of uh, uh, renouncing such luxuries as restaurants, uh, big, uh, holidays, expensive holidays, and so on and so on. And uh, uh, in, in East Germany, on the contrary, we could observe the rise of post-material value. 
So they are asking Hungary, most people would argue that uh, basically the government is bad because her standard of living is decreasing. In East Germany, you would find post materialistic values such as environment protection, such as uh, communal, so corporations, so cooperatives, and so on and so on. So, while in Hungary, there, was, there were no post materialistic values mentioned by the workers in East Germany, uh, we had that. The dimension of human relations, that was very common. Uh, all in, uh, in this cohort, all workers would tell me that the human relations, social relations were much better before the change of regimes than after. Uh, social, they would recall the socialist brigades with a sense of loss. And they would, uh, actually the Germans would speak of Erbogengesellschaft, which is like uh, racing society or something like that. So people would keep, we teach, kill each other for individual advantages. Uh, so in the field of human relations, uh, both in uh, East Germany and in Hungary, uh, there was a strong criticism of the growing egoism and uh, growing uh, uh, inequalities in the new regime. How did this experience impact on the social and political attitudes of the workers? Uh, in Hungary, even in the uh, Soviet, let me once more, that was 2002 2004. And at that time, I should speak about that, but at that time there was a socialist uh, party, the, so, there was a socialist liberal coalition ruling. And even then, people would argue that the Hungarian uh, government does not protect national interests, it sells out the country to foreign interests, and uh, basically, you need a strong national government and a strong leader. So, more or less, this was. Uh, formulated already at that time. In the GDR, there was a strong critique of the social, uh, of the newly established social hierarchies, especially the big distance between workers and managers, the big social gap between workers and managers, and this post-materialism was, uh, was there. The, it was a common criticism that the trade unions were weak, and the labor movement was weak in general. And I think I, uh, Andras, please feel free to continue because you know, I don't want to over my time. So if you are interested, I can tell you much more about all of these things, but these are more or less the most important conclusions of this work. So even I will here continue, but even in the uh, beginning of the 2000s, uh, in Hungary, there was a, des a desire, but uh, there was a, an appeal of a strong state and a strong leader. Two more sentences. So the Horeca regime was even even so. It is on the desk. Yeah. Yeah. It is on the desk for sure. So uh, the Horeca regime received an unambiguously negative evaluation from the Germans, and the Kada regime was more ambiguously evaluated in Hungary. But I'm actually hoping that something will be So this part is about a recent research we did together with Esther and in a, in a major manufacturing press plant. And really the question was what we experienced is that most of the workers are attracted to right wing, or even to radical right. And the question is why workers are attracted to right? What is the role of the memory of the socialist trust? in their political choice, what is the role of the current mistakes or perceived mistakes of the post-socialist political left, and what is the role of the policies of the right-wing parties in this political shift. Now a few words about the interviews, it was done this year, they were semi-structured individual group interviews, 
combined with ethnographic research. What is interesting there is our highly paid, highly skilled core workers who are enjoying practical lifetime employment security. Also, they are part of a very strong union, they are union leaders. So they are, who should be attracted maybe to the left, maybe not, but they are attracted mostly to right-wing parties. What we felt during the interviews, that they're really feeling widespread, there is a widespread perception of unjust inequality, and also they feel to be exploited, especially if they compare their own wages to the German sister plant. Also, they were highly discontent with the political corruption, with the political regime, with the blood oligarchical nature of the Hungarian political system. Now, what is the context, which is also very important? There was a major shift in Hungary after 2006. Before 2006, we had practically a two-block political system and alternated political left and political right. After 2006, there was a major shift. What has happened, the old left has weakened considerably and only today has 10-15% support. There were, we were seeing a lot of various new left political movements and political parties, but they are not really successful. What is really became very successful is the centrist right, which is maybe in most of the Western Europe you wouldn't consider to be centrist right. But they are enjoying a monetary position in the political system, and the strongest opposition in the, of, is the radical right, the Yopik. And there is a strong shift in workers' support to the right, and especially to the radical right. Now, as Esther mentioned, the Hungarian workers were highly divided even before the Second World War. What is important for us, there was two major social strategies in working workers' communities. One were the low-skilled rural community workers. They were typically Catholic, conservative, and nationalists as political culture concern. And there were the skilled urban workers who were the basis of the social party before the Second World War. Now, what is the role of memories of the social past in, among workers today? There is a strong feeling of criminalization of the social past. First of all, because of the rural workers, they still remembering the unjust policies and unfair policies of the Stalinist period. Also, there were lasting memories of workers. Because 56 was a workers' movement, also, there was strong retribution against revolutionaries. They are, these workers who were now in 40 45, they perceived the socialist regime in the last, last years of the socialist regime, so they feel there was a failed and, uh, and blocked regime. And also, they perceived the former nomenclatura as an alien and hostile elite. Also very important, not only the past, but the current perception of the, of the current Socialist Party. In general, they see the modern Socialist Party as a party of technocrats and, and politicians, far away from them. A closed elite organization with no real attachment to workers. The Socialist Party was in government during the economic crisis, so it is implementing the non-liberal policies, which is perceived them as not being real leftist party plus corruption, and plus a moral issue, which is very special Hungarian issue, that the then Prime Minister admitted in an open speech that he lied to the voters. Now, what is interesting, although the old left is going down, new left is unable to get support among workers, and mostly because it is seen as a playground of Budapest based elite intellectuals, no connection to workers, and to their conservative values. Now, what is interesting is, is the policies of the right wing, because there is a shift in right wing towards the left, to a certain extent. Because the, it was the right wing, Fidesz, which is fought against so-called neoliberal reforms, and proposed the realistic new workfare-based welfare state, which is, to a certain extent, fit to our perception, to our interview partners, who see themselves as hardworking people and 
this thing, this them sign, for example, from the Roma, who are seen as a I'm who is just being on welfare. National state policy is fighting against Brussels, foreign power, foreign capitals. This is the when the perception of exploitation of workers is answered by the by the right. The traditional family-oriented values are fit to their own rather conservative traditional values. Anti-immigrant slogans, and also is very important, we have a charismatic leader with Viktor Orban. Now, what is the key for the popularity of the yogi, the radical right? He's saying the same as Fidesz, even more radical. Revolting against the world system, against globalization, against multinationals. And to a certain extent, this is the party, which is the party of the underdogs, who is not part of the elite, and could respond to that feelings of the workers, which 40, 60 years ago, the left done. No conclusion. I think nobody was in Hungary, but is the conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> and especially what is the way forward. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now, <laughs> I'm sure that question will come up. Uh, we'll go straight to the next presenter. Maybe while I'm introducing you, you can set up the computer. I actually or... don't mind sitting here because I don't have proper PowerPoint presentation. Ah, great. Just one illustration. May I ask you again to kind of settle and then at the end of my presentation, I just only show one slide if possible. Okay, okay so I can stay here. Okay, um, so. Maybe you can set up. Do you need a second to find that slide? Or? Um, yeah, I can move later on. At the end, okay. Yeah. Can I um, move? No, 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 she can just. Yeah. Uh, we'll, take, we'll do it this way. Okay, well, so next up is Kalina Yordanova, who, uh, who is a psychotherapist and also a researcher at the new Bulgarian University. And, um, has uh, studied psychoanalysis and anthropology and uh, published on memory transmission in Bosnia and Herzegovina and now we'll be talking about the predecessor of that particular yeah. state. Um, and uh, so thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. So uh, my presentation will take you to a slightly different perspective since I'm going to talk um, about memory from an anthropological and psychological perspective, so it has less to do with history and politics. Um, and it's going to be about memories um, of the second generation, so how we form memories on the basis of what we know, observe and learn from the previous generations. Why is that important? And I will use a Boston example to describe how the second generation is currently forming their memories of the socialist past. Um, before I start, um, I would like to say that this is part of a larger project, which was part of my um, doctoral research in Bosnia. And it was about memory transmission of traumatic experiences. So, uh, without implying that socialism is a, a necessarily something traumatic, I will draw mainly on literature which investigates the transmission of the traumatic experience of our generation. So, I need to make this uh, clear in the beginning. Um, and I will start to my presentation first saying how I understand memory, and uh, then I would say a few, I would give examples with few concepts. I will be using so that I contextualize my, my research in the previous body of literature. Um, so, uh, to my understanding, memory is a phenomenon which organizes our past and, and uh, um, constructs our identity as Polish, Bosnian, Bulgarian, and so, so forth. Um, and um, it maintains the identity and the, the sense of knowing who we are and where we come from. So this is why um, it's important for children to seek information about the past of their parents, because this is how they embed themselves in this relationship. So um, I will touch upon the uh, concept of memory transmission as understood in psychoanalysis, and I will mainly draw on Van Falken's research on the transmission across generations, which he thinks happens unconsciously, mainly and primarily when it deals with the troubled past. 
Um, I will also use um, the work of Heidi Feinberg, who talks about the undeveloped identities of the second generations, meaning that when the previous generations have gone through violent experiences, um, the second generation necessarily feels um, sympathy for the suffering of the previous generations, but also accusations for having allowed violence happen. So this is where ambivalence comes from. Um, and finally, I will use the concept of post-memory, um, as coined by Mariana Hirsch, um, in relation to the Holocaust studies, uh, in order to explain how second generations seek information about the past of their parents. And uh, that post-memory represents the related response of the second generation to something that happened beforehand, before they were born. So I, um, I will argue um, three main points. And first point being that um, transmission takes place unconsciously mainly in the everyday interaction uh, with family members. Of course, it is shaped by uh, political and uh, social discourses. But what children, particularly in my research, um, basically uh, told me was pretty much shaped by their everyday interaction with their parents, um, by narrative medium, landscape, even bodily symptom. And I will give one example um, from a home visit to a Bosnian boy or 15, um, who gave me by the end of the interview a um, um, key holder, which had the, um, uh, the slogan of the uh, 1984 Olympics, Winter Olympics held in Sarajevo. And uh, he told me that he was proud of being Bosnian because um, the Olympic passed of his home place. And when I asked him how he knew, he knew about it, he told me that his father took him to a football game. And uh, then he told him the uh, fact that Bosnia hosted the Olympics and also showed him the places where the Olympics games uh, uh, had taken place. So, as anthropologist Maurice Bloch argues, the combination of narrative, emotional connection to our parents and idiom basically is what forms our understanding of the past. Um, of our family. So, um, briefly about the memories of the uh, wartime generation and the post memories of the, the second generations. When I interviewed the parents on their socialist past, they mainly spoke about freedom, safety, and enjoyment. This is how they remembered Yugoslavia. But um, we have to um, also consider the fact that we always construct history from the context of the present day perspective. It is something we construct up a pool. Uh, this is something which we construct in retrospect. So they necessarily had in mind their experience of the violent breakup and the post-war marginalization they went through. So in, in one sense or another, the memory of socialist Yugoslavia was an idealized form of reality. And when they spoke of freedom, they uh, gave uh, several examples, having coffee in Belgrade and coming back, traveling from Slovenia to Macedonia to visit friends. Safety was described as sleeping in the park and keep your front door open at night time. When they spoke about enjoyment, I had the feeling that Yugoslavia was the real home of plenty because they spoke about free, um, entering free into the cinema, uh, good salaries, long holidays, um, a health insurance, and so on and so forth. So uh, this kind of a, um, a narrative of an idealized version of the past necessarily was necessarily possible against their experience of the violent breakup. However, their children didn't have this first-hand experience. They only knew it from their second-hand uh, second experience from what they observed from some historical bits and pieces that came to them through film, media, and so on forth. So the post-memory of the socialist Yugoslavia was rather ambivalent. They would say um, that Yugoslavia was something to be proud of, but also it was old-fashioned. For instance, celebrating Dito's birthdays nationwide was considered to be pretty fake. 
Um, also, uh, it was subject to faith standards and principles, and the, the very slogan "Brand new community" didn't have the meaning it had to the previous generations. It, it was considered to be a, an empty trope they couldn't emotionally connect to. So, basically, for children, it was a very much of an ambivalent concept. Uh, in contrast to what it was to parents. And here was my illustration, it was a drawing of a, but I can tell you what it, it represented. It was a drawing of a 15-year-old boy uh, whom I asked to make um, a map of Yugoslavia. Uh, he's Bosnian from Sarajevo. So he drew the map making Bosnia uh, twice as big as it was in reality. And uh, uh, this was in a way an expression of how the current national discourses in Bosnia basically shaped the post memory of the past, making his country being central and the biggest one out of all the republics. So, um, in conclusions, and I hope I'm well of time, um, I argue that the notion of the socialist Yugoslavia was reconstructed by older and younger generations always in contrast with their present day experiences. Um, second, um, I argue that while for the previous generations Yugoslavia is still an idealized version of the past, for the generations of today it's rather an impermanent concept. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions before we uh, respond to them. So, side first. Um, I have two questions. <coughs> the first question goes to Esther. Um, you talked about the rise of post-materialist values on the GDR. And I wondered how did you measure those post-materialist values? So um, did, did I get you right that you uh, took interviews in the 2000s and, and um, this is your, your measurement or um, it, it, I just wonder because in the GDR um, um, when they had the, their first free elections in, in March of 1990, um, workers and uh, especially workers did not vote for those parties who stood for uh, post-materialist socialism. Uh, like uh, the opposition movement in the GDR, but uh, they uh, majority uh, voted for um, for the conservative forces. And um, as I understood it, one of the most uh, important uh, important um, incentive, therefore, was not uh, post materialist but rather materialist, uh, because it was a promise that uh, they will have uh, Western capitalism and wel welfare and the well-being of, of the West. So that would be my first question, how did you measure this? And my second question would be to Andras. Um, it's, uh, you said um, you have very interesting findings for Hungary, and I wonder if those findings are specific to a post-communist country, um, because uh, it resembles many uh, uh, developments in Western Europe too, that uh, voters defect from uh, left-wing parties and vote for right-wing, and especially for radical right-wing parties uh, like uh, Front National in France or uh, the, the um, FPÖ in, in Austria. So this would be my question to you. Yes, I, uh, I have the one question to the uh, first question about the communists and uh, one or two questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask about those uh, memories of this uh, working class um, people. How these memories are generally produced? In what political, social, and cultural uh, context, let's say, uh, do they appear? In other words, what's the discourse of communism or socialism uh, period, and how is it used nowadays? And uh, the similar questions, what are other discourses that organize uh, people's uh, consciousness or imagination? Uh, in other words, uh, uh, because I have the feeling that uh, we should somehow put these memories, uh, memoirs, memories uh, in a broader context. Uh, for example, in the context of education, um, I don't know, uh, religious message or the message of popular culture. Yes, because in uh, this way we could understand how this uh, uh, memories uh, of the social system and uh, uh, how these uh, political choices or sim uh, their, uh, yeah, this, uh, sympathies are now, um, how, how does it happen that they appear in the way like this? 
yes, was the, 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 the broader culture uh, context. And uh, to the uh, second uh, panelist, I'd like to ask a similar question about this trauma. How is it produced and who produces it? Uh, and who transmits the uh, trauma? In other, way, uh, in other words, who has the voice? Who has the uh, right and who uh, represents the second generation, uh, how you call it? And I'm generally, uh, because I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm, I did a similar uh, research, not uh, from the uh, psychoanalytical or anthropological uh, perspective, but from the literary perspective, uh, I analyzed the uh, memoirs of uh, the children and grandchildren of uh, uh, ex-communist uh, dignitaries, which are published uh, in Poland, and I uh, would be cautious uh, with the idea of uh, transplanting the concept of trauma from the Holocaust studies to the communist studies, because I have the feeling that sometimes, for example, in Poland, this is a very useful uh, narrative or very useful tool. Uh, to make uh, the uh, to make uh, Nazism and communism equal. In other words, to make equation between Nazism and and, uh, and communism. Yeah, one question. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you very much, all of you, for this very interesting presentation. And I have two questions for both papers, if it's possible. Yeah. Can one you is hand, uh, wait, just to make? Sure. Do you think you can retain it enough for you prefer to answer okay, before? Okay, if it's a longer question, maybe we can... It's a short one, actually. Two very short. Okay. Uh, one is to Andres, uh, could you please be more specific about the way far right employ this uh, socialist memory or memory about the socialist period in their political agenda? And uh, the, the second one to Kalina, uh, as far as I understand, you, you said that the memory of the socialist time is idealized in, in uh, children's narratives and in parents' narratives. In parents' narratives. The, is there any uh, attempt to use this memory as a memory of trauma? Uh, is it a popular narrative to talk about the, the socialist past as a traumatic experience or the memory of the war? and uh, the solution of Yugoslavia overshadows this drama completely. Thank you. Yes, that's a very good question, and uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, look, uh, it's a wrong, I try not to answer wrong because of time, but um, in this book, which was mentioned in the later, I think I argue that uh, this policy which Horeke uh, implemented and both both have implemented uh, mm -hmm. these welfare state uh, driven policies or uh, welfare policies uh, in fact turn the workers consciousness towards the right toward to open to capitalism so it's the, the, the process of capitalization started in, in this sense much before uh, 1989 and if you just consider that uh, uh, also the propaganda went on, on both sides and the German propaganda became less and less credible even for the Germans and the German propaganda became very credible with the shops, with the autos, with the bananas, coffee, and so on and so on. So I would say that there's a big difference between 1990 and, and, and 10 years later, uh, 2002 or 2004. And uh, this research was in fact repeated, and I did, uh, but I, I, mean, I need also something like 14 interviews in 2013 uh, in East Germany, and uh, there. Uh, basically, it was even more crystallized that the GDR is seen as something. Okay, Hoyke is rejected. The GDR is rejected as such, but uh, the left-wing values like egalitarianism and uh, this post-material material side. I didn't have a survey if, if, if they were they were life history interviews, and uh, uh, these communitarian values were were uh, mentioned with a large emphasis. Or also, for instance, unemployed organized uh, clubs or these networks, and it was also mentioned that in Hungary you couldn't find that. Uh, so, or trade unions were also active, or I, I met the shop stewards who, uh, who were active in uh, trade unionism, basically because, of, because they wanted to be in a community or feel to have a community. And one more thing, which was, uh, it shows the bias of the research. 
Uh, in Hungary, everybody, and no workers knew that they are Hungarian, so it's a problem. But in East Germany, everybody knew that they would talk to a Hungarian. It excludes the right wing workers because they wouldn't really <laughs> share their ideas with someone coming from Hungary. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so this is to the, to the question. And I think that what I, I consider important is the difference that uh, uh, in, in, the, in East Germany you still find, or in Germany you still find a strong left wing uh, uh, discourse, or, and this is also passion to discourse. So there is the Linke and there are other left wing organizations. And in Hungary, the, the we couldn't have time, but on the other I think, uh, try to contextualize this a bit. That basically, the liberals and the right wing nationalist right wing shared the view that the state communist, uh, state, state socialist past was somehow bad and should be neglected altogether. So, this is the more or less dominant discourse in Hungary now, and this is different in Germany where you find other competing discourses. So, maybe this explains that uh, workers would use their Erbogen Gesellschaft, Zweitel Gesellschaft, they would probably take it from the media, not from <laughs> themselves. Uh, so, there is a left wing uh, public arena, public discourse in Germany, uh, which you find uh, very marginal in Hungary, or it's very much related to these intellectual uh, networks. And I do uh, emphasize one more thing as I hear this talk, that there, in, in Hungary there, there is a big, uh, even today, there's a big social gap between intellectuals and industrial workers. So intellectuals are seen as something alien, as something special, and not special, <laughs> privileged, <laughs> even, or some, 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 some kind of strange class. And, uh, and uh, uh, this perhaps also explains that why intellectual, the intelligent, intellectual based left wing uh, networks uh, really echoless among the workers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm interested in the question of Famous German historian, he was a conservative one, he has not a good fame because of a historic debate, Eric Nolte. And he has a wonderful book, actually, which he gave the title European Civil War. And his idea is that until 45 there was a European Civil War in between left and right, which in, in Western Europe is ended by a compromise and a new post war reconstruction again is practically with the moderation. And, and both are settlement between left and right. To a certain extent, to cut short, in East and Central Europe, that civil war has ended in 89. Officially, but in practice still we are living a kind of cold civil war situation. Because the um, various tough action of the Stalinist regime and the suppressed memories which came about, came for after 89, and this really is to a certain extent tra still traumatizing because we are still in the second generation. And the extreme right and even the center right is using these traumatized memories instead of doing like in Spain when, they, when the transition took place in Spain, they did the Pacto de Olvido so that we forget in the past. And we don't speak about who did what during the Franco regime in the civil war. In Hungary, there wasn't done such a compromise. So the political parties are using the, the civil war of the past to discredit their current political enemies. So the left is always arguing that the right is really the fascist one. And the right is always arguing that the left and right is they are communist ones. And because it is constant argument and picking up the past, we are still living with the past. We are still living. Our interview partners still living in the past, although they are, we are only in 2015. And I think it's a big problem. And one of the reasons is that because we have traumatized memories, we have a traumatized political life. But skillful political entrepreneurs are very good at exploiting this traumatization and instead of healing the wounds, they are opening the wounds and creating the vision. 